We have exciting guests today with us for our fifth professional development session for the Diverag session. I think everyone that is here right now has been here before. Um, but as you know, Diverag is creating visual and augmented reality experiences to teach agricultural literacy to middle and high school youth and making this available for educators to use in the classroom. So we're excited that we are um, uh, coming up uh, to the sessions about the content and the five apps that we're developing it has been an amazing journey and push work. And today we're gonna be learning a little bit about our second app, which is on the content of dairy farms and milk processing. So basically, we'll be talking about topics related to dairy processes, farming, des farming decisions driven by sustainability and efficiency, how milk and cheese quality is assessed, um, how science promotes animal health, and all of the kind of good stuff related to dairy farming, milk and processing. And we have our two content experts here today to talk to us about this content and how they chose those to be um, highlighted in our apps. And we also have Eat, Time Looper, uh, CEO and founder of Time Looper with us today, as always, to be able to give you a sneak peek of behind the scenes of this app. So with no further ado, I'll introduce Dr. Krista Moore, who is our Dive for Egg program coordinator um, and co-investigator as well for the project and a dairy content expert. She's a 4-H endowed companion animal faculty at OSU Extension. And we have Anna Brownie as well, who is one of our Dive for Egg senior personnel and dairy content expert. She works with 4-H Open Campus and as assistant professor of practice at OSU. So welcome to have both of them to share the time today and talk to you about the content on the Zap and tag team with Eat to show you a sneak peek of what it's gonna look like. So with no further ado, welcome Kristen, welcome Anna, welcome Eat again. All right, so we have some poll questions today that we're gonna kick everybody off on um, just to kind of see what you know um, about some dairy farms and some dairy questions. And then um, I'm gonna talk a little bit specifically about the dairy that's featured um, in our app because we have a really unique partnership with them that we're super excited um, to share um, that has really helped with our, well, basically this whole process wouldn't have happened without um, them just giving a free for all a visit of the dairy. So that's kind of exciting. Do you want to go ahead and launch um, the poll questions? I, I know you. that, yeah. Oh, you're launching them. Thank you, Kristen. Okay, if everybody could just make, um, <clears throat> take a quick second to answer the poll questions. I'm not gonna answer them because I don't wanna skew anybody's results. Okay, are y'all ready for the reveal? Anna, you ready for the reveal? I'm ready. Okay. See what everybody knows. Oh, I haven't done this in a bit. Okay, share results. Am I sharing? I don't know. Okay, so how many cows need to be milked to produce a million pounds of milk a day? This was, wow, this was really split. Um, <clears throat> friends, 500? No, not a chance. Um, 40,000 cows need to be milked three times a day to produce a million pounds of milk. And we want to make sure that we know that we're talking about the difference between pounds and gallons, not the same. Um, when working with Three Mile, they were very um, insistent that they measure everything in pounds of milk, um, not by the gallon. So um, 40,000 cows are getting milked three times a day at the Three Mile Canyon Farms Dairy to produce a million pounds of milk a day. The next one is how many pounds of milk does it take to produce a two pound brick of cheese? And you're all real close, but it's actually 10 pounds of milk to produce a two pound brick of cheese. So we're producing a million pounds divided by 10 pounds is a lot of bricks of cheese in one day. And then how many different types of cheese are there? Um, we're close, but not quite close enough. Um, the answer is actually 33,000. And Kristen's gonna talk to us about that. 
um, fun bacterial process and how it produces um, 33,000 different types of cheese, which is just a little bit mind blowing to me. Um, I have a lot of taste testing left to do. Okay, I'm gonna start sharing. Um, we're gonna share some information and some slides with you to start. Um, and then we'll walk through the app with Eat a little bit later. So I'm gonna go first here. Um, slides. Just a second so I have, I can see my notes. Okay, so we are talking about the virtual reality experience of the dairy farm um, and milk processing and the cheese lab. So lots of fun stuff to share today. Um, let's see, next slide. So got cows, yeah, about 40,000. When we think of a dairy farm um, normally, I, I don't know about you, but before um, moving to where I live now, I live in Eastern Oregon in Boardman um, and just outside of Boardman is where the Three Mile Canyon Dairy Farm um, is and exists. Oh, I wanna tell you all, if you have questions while we're kind of going along, drop them in the chat and Kristen will monitor when I'm talking. Oh, good, thank you, Susan, you put that in there. Um, and I don't mind if you if you like do raise hand feature and you interrupt a little bit. Um, we're fairly casual here and we're still a pretty small group. So I wanna make sure that everybody asks the question when you're thinking about it so that um, you don't forget for later. So we've got Three Mile Canyon Dairy Farm um, is in Boardman. Uh, in Eastern Oregon, if you're not familiar with that. And uh, when I think, when I used to think about a dairy farm, you would kind of think of an old man and a barn and a milking stool. And, and you would think about milking and having buckets of milk sloshing. And those are kinds of things that people thought about as dairy farms. And then, um, you know, automation has become such a big role in everything. And you think about that. And so you imagine these operations growing over time with more automation. And you think of some dairies that have 100 cows or 200 cows. And it's almost unfathomable to think about a dairy operation or farm. Um, they're milking 40,000 cows and have anywhere between um, 50 and 60,000 on site in various stages of growth uh, through the process. So it's, um, it's a lot to manage from food to animal welfare to the milking transport and about a million steps in between. It's definitely more than a 24 hour a day, 3, 365 days a year job. It, it doesn't close for Christmas. Nobody gets Thanksgiving off. Cows have to be milked three times a day. It's a 24 hour a day operation. So I think that that's something that is really important for people to wrap their head around. It takes an entire team of dedicated, hardworking um, people to manage all of that. And the Three Mile Canyon Dairy is actually part of a larger 93,000 acre farm um, along the Columbia River Dairy. And so it is a precision irrigated agriculture farm that grows everything from blueberries to potatoes to organic onions, um, organic watermelon, triticale, um, some other grains. It depends on what the crop rotation for the year is, uh, what they have. So it's a really fascinating place to visit. Um, the, <clears throat> so for our presentation today, we're really going to talk about three main areas of focus as it relates to the dairy farm, and those are um, their community relationships, sustainability, and animal welfare. Um, so a partnership, um, I work in 4-H, In uh, I was split between two counties until recently, and now I'm just working strictly in Umatilla County, and um, the dairy farm is located in Morrow County just right next door to us. And when um, when I started about five years ago with Extension, uh, we knew this farm was out there and we knew that there was unlimited potential for visiting, for hands-on activities, for um, visits, for field trips, for all kinds of things, but nothing was really happening out there. And you know why? Nobody had ever asked. Nobody had ever asked to visit. Nobody had ever asked to check things out. Um, no one had ever asked. And so, I was able to work really hard with um, some of the dairy managers uh, to get us out there on the farm. And we started with, about five years ago, um, a Morrow County 4-H field day on the farm. And it the first year we had about 25 kids that showed up, no parents, not really any community members. And it was kind of a small little thing. We didn't really know what we were doing. 
And that's really grown over the past five years to include um, anywhere between 80 and 100 kids and volunteers and parents and visitors. And it's a really cool day of hands-on experiences where kids work on um, irrigation work, animal care, crop science, and equipment safety. Uh, this is a really big feat for uh, a dairy and a farm. It takes a lot of time out of their day. They have more than 300 employees and they all live locally in our community. So it really is a community effort and they're really involved in all of the things that are happening in our community. And as such, because of this partnership, we were really excited to honor them with our with a 2019 cooperator, cooperator Award from the OSU Extension Service for their commitment and dedication to our um, Extension and 4-H programs um, in there. So these are just a couple of pictures of them receiving their award and then um, some sneak peeks of kind of some stuff that happens on um, field day on the farm. Everything that I'm sharing as a resource on here, um, all the photos and everything are from the Three Mile Canyon Farms Facebook page. Uh, if you wanna follow them on Facebook, they have great social media, uh, really beautiful pictures about farm and cows and all of that. So if you haven't followed them or liked them, follow them on Instagram or like them on Facebook, um, check them out after this because it's uh, lots of good information I share regularly as well. Uh, about three years ago, we started a dairy heifer program with the farm. And the cool thing about the dairy heifer program is that 4-H youth get to um, borrow a dairy heifer from the farm for a period of 10 months. They go through an application process and an interview process to talk about um, animal care, safety, um, their location, what kinds of housing and uh, safe places they have for housing a dairy heifer at their own um, farm. And then during the 10 month possession period, youth work on um, a dedicated feeding program with the farm nutritionist. Uh, they meet with the veterinary team for regular checkups to make sure their heifers are growing properly and are safe and healthy. They practice showing and fitting and just general overall animal care, all while working directly with the three mile team. And then each August, the youth participate with their heifers at the county fair, um, showing in the dairy category. And after the fair, they return the heifers to the farm um, where they're old enough to be bred, um, and then they have babies. So while there may be more than a few tears shed on that last day, because these heifers are kind of like um, having a great big puppy dog that licks you and touches you and wants to be petted and wants attention, um, they... Uh, give the heifers back to the farm and uh, end their experience for the 4-H year and can reapply for the next year. Melinda, I, I see you have a question. Yeah, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, I just wanted to see, is it just for kids in 4-H within that county, Anna, or is it for any kid that qualifies? Because that sounds like a cool program. Yeah, right now, um, just because of the proximity to the farm, it is for youth within Morrow County. Um, because of the specific um, genetic breeding program because of the specific uh, health and nutrition requirements um, for the growth of the heifers. They do, uh, we only have it in, in Morro County for right now, and a lot of it has to do with time and space capacity for the farm to loan out um, the heifers. And so we've been running anywhere between 10 and 15 youth participating in the program uh, per year, which is about 10% of kids participating in 4-H in the county. So one of the other things that's really important that we talk about a lot, and, and you'll see this um, theme research in the app um, in multiple pins and multiple locations um, in, in parts that we're going to talk about, and that's sustainability. And sustainability has been at the forefront of the priorities of the dairy and the three and the Three Mile Canyon farms in general um, for a really long time, since the mid-90s, before sustainability was even kind of a cool thing anyone was talking about. Um, they're proud to operate what we call a closed loop system. And in the simplest form, that basically means that nothing goes to waste and everything has a purpose. And um, so this graphic is kind of cool because it, uh, in Morrow County, 
there's so many things that are all connected agriculturally, a lot of it having to do with Fremont Canyon farms. Um, you can see that processed potato waste, we, we process billions of pounds of French fries in Boardman, um, Berlin, Weston, every single day. All of that, all of the peels and all of the leftover waste that doesn't get made into fries gets re-trucked back out to the dairy and it gets integrated into the um, food system for the uh, dairy, for the heifers and for all of the feed animals out there. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, it goes through finished goods. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how animal waste gets processed into um, natural gas and renewable energy for the farm. So it really um, the sustainability piece about this is something that we really want to share because a lot of times large, large corporate farms really get a bad rap about pollution and um, a lot of other just major issues that look kind of icky. And we really want to share the story that uh, this farm is really doing what's good for the environment um, and for the region in um, as far as sustainability goes. And in 2020, Three Mile was really proud to be recognized as one of three dairies in the US to receive um, the sustainability award by the Innovation Center of US Dairy from the um, USDA. So that was pretty exciting. And one of, one of the best parts of this app is gonna feature components of the closed loop system um, and the important role that that plays for the environment and for animal welfare. Um, another part we'll talk a little bit about is carbon cycling and how it relates to the methane digester. Um, <clears throat> so basically the power of poop, um, this is sure to be a favorite discussion for um, students. I'm thinking especially between the fifth and seventh grade boys variety. Um, with nearly 50,000 cows all in one place, you can imagine that, that that adds up to a lot of poop. And what do you do with that? It can't just sit there in piles. So we're really excited that this app is going to feature the methane digester process. And it's basically a giant poop mixer that turns animal waste into power, fertilizer, and even animal bedding. So that part's going to be really cool. It's gonna be a great feature of the app. And it's really um, kind of distinct when, when the methane digester was being built out at Three Mile um, about probably about 16, 17 years ago, it was one of the first ones on a um, large commercial farming operation in the country. And um, Three Mile, because of this, actually produces about between 30 and 60% of their own power, um, depending on the time of the year. So that's exciting. Any questions where we're at so far? All right, slide on. All right. Um, animal welfare is one of uh, the most important components of Three Mile, um, their entire operation. So uh, all of these signs that are um, down here at the bottom that you can see, they're posted as you come in and out of the farm and in various places throughout the farm as you're going through. So I don't, I don't know if anybody remembers some videos that surfaced from a dairy farm and elsewhere in the country a few years ago, but it was really damaging and it wasn't the best reflection of what happens within the industry. And I know that when those um, things came out, that the dairy manager um, at Three Mile was so concerned and so worried that it would give all of these commercial dairy operations such a bad rap for what was happening in one place. And so Three Mile is really proud to say that they have a three-pronged animal welfare um, system uh, and a animal welfare committee. And they were invited to be on the call today at this time that they're actually having their monthly animal welfare meeting right now. And so they weren't able to join us. Um, so that their animal welfare committee is made up of um, team members from the farm that meet monthly to, to advance their knowledge about animal welfare and what's happening specific to the Three Mile location. Um, they have monthly visits by Northwest University-based animal advocate veterinarians for inspections, team member education, and the newest research and data in the industry. And then they're also evaluated regularly by a third party called Validus, an internationally recognized outside and independent animal welfare auditor. Um, and they visit each year and conduct a thorough inspection um, and complete a report card. And we're pretty proud to say that they do um, a pretty fabulous job on their report card each and every year. 
And so one of the things that um, they always talk about when kids are present at the farm, um, in addition to this animal welfare is the, um, is basically the golden rule of taking care of animals is that if you take care of animals, they'll take care of you. And that's the um, old adage that they um, teach the kids every single time that we're there. We've never been there a time where that hasn't been a priority. And so uh, it's important that they, that as we're sharing this information and we're sharing this app with people that everybody understands that animal welfare is really the top priority of what happens at the dairy before any milk is even produced. So who is who? I think this part's kind of important. And um, Kristen and I, you know, we we are dairy content experts. I don't know that I would I would consider myself an expert. Um, I'm kind of a, a three mile Canadian farm like passion party love person. So I just create. I, I just like being um, there and being part of the farm. But it, um, there's some terms that are kind of important, and we're going to share those with um, with everybody because. We realized uh, in developing the app, we knew that there were people that didn't understand, you know, kind of basic cow terminology. And so a calf, um, I think we have this cute little guy here. Um, a calf is a baby cow that's usually a year old or less. And so we would refer to them as calves. Uh, at Three Mile, they um, keep female calves. And bull calves are, some of them are saved and um, others of them are sent to be raised as beef cattle, even though they're dairy cows when they're born as bulls. Um, at Three Mile, calves are born each and every day, um, no matter rain, shine, weather, hail, stacks of snow, 120 degree heat, um, calves are being born at Three Mile every single day. Uh, so they, uh, one of our favorite places to visit when we were filming was for sure the maternity barn um, where all the babies were. And um, we were even lucky enough to see some born while we were there, um, which was really exciting. And so that part is um, going to be a component of the app that kids get to see, not the cows being born, but the babies. Um, uh, after the cows are um, born, they go to live in these cute little calf hutches that you see in the picture here. And um, they're fed bottles twice a day, and then they're also fed their mixed ration and water every single day. So um, <clears throat> they have their own little space while they're really small babies. And then as they get to be a little bit bigger, um, kids can see in the app where they're living in a um, more like a community space of five to 10 calves together. And then as, then as they even get bigger um, to maybe this heifer stage, which we see um, in the slide with the kids next door, um, <clears throat> this heifer phase is calves that are over a year old. They're kind of, we call it like the pesky teenager stage where they're ranging in um, age from about nine months to two years old. So heifers have not been bred and they cannot be milked. So the program that the kids participate in is with the dairy heifers um, that, that haven't been bred yet. And then next up we have well mama cows. This is where they, um, those full grown heifers are bred at two years old um, to produce their cows. And after giving birth, cows are then able to produce milk. I know, that seems silly that we share that, but really it's kind of important because we have a lot of people that don't understand um, be just because they've never experienced um, that cow process. Not all cows are created equal because some of them are not in fact cows yet. They're still calves or heifers. Um, the majority of the cows at Three Mile um, and featured in the app are Jersey cows. That's their breed. They're this light um, creamy brown color. And the reason that the Jersey cows are used is because um, they produce a high quantity of milk, five to seven gallons for milking. And um, they are preferred for the cheese making process as their milk is higher in fat and proteins. And so when Kristen talks to us about cheese. Um, we'll learn a little bit more about that. So any questions about um, just a, the very hundred mile up overview of three mile and then with E, we're going to kind of fly through the app a little bit and figure out where where we're at in the farm as we're visiting. Any questions about this?
All right, Kristen, take it away. Do you want to show the app or do you want to keep talking about cheese? Oh, I I can't remember what we decided on our schedule. We, we hadn't decided. Eat, are you ready to share the first portion of the app with us? Yes, I am. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing so we can see Eat's screen. And Eat, as you're doing that, we may have a couple of people that are new, maybe not. So maybe a quick kind of intro. Mm -hmm. Right. Sure. So um, we're using virtual reality and augmented reality technologies. Um, VR is 360 degree image. So wherever you look, you see something versus augmented reality is projecting a, an object in your present environment. So now we're gonna see examples from both. Um, virtual reality and an augmented reality that are just much more engaging tools to tell stories visualize topics that are not possible to visualize otherwise or to take people to other places. So it is hard to describe what it is. Uh, you have to try and then test it. And then that's why we built this. And then soon it's going to be in your hands. Um, right now I'm going to share my smartphone screen. It is compatible with most of the iPhone and an iPad and AirPads. And um, it also, we are working on the browser version, which is less immersive. But um, let's start with the mobile version. All right, so um, this is the mobile applications UI. There are many, many institutions using the same platform. And on this platform, we are creating multiple experiences. And then today we are gonna to look at Dairy Farm. And here, when I click we win AR, now I'm going to project a 3D model on my desk. I'm scanning my desk. I place it, it's loading. And there it is. So I'm going to adjust the size. So what we are looking at is a 3D model on my desk. Like is the computer, so how it is I'm sharing. And what I do is, the only thing that I do is, I move my phone around it. And this is digital. As you can see, my hand is here, but there's nothing here. And uh, we designed this 3D model um, all together with our designers, Get Brief, from Manny and Kristen. And then all these pins have educational content attached to them. And now I'm going to follow Anne's, uh, Anne will tell me what to open, what to open, what to activate. Let's go to the meal for 33,000. All right, this, is a this great, one. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, Get the, the model. Mm -hmm. And then Let's go here. Now I'm tapping the pin. Heifers walk to the barns each day to get their total mixed ration, or TMR. TMR helps ensure heifers get a complete and balanced diet. Animal nutritionists at Three Mile Canyon Farms formulate TMR to support heifers' growth. TMR also provides a variety. Like a trail mix, all the ingredients are mixed together and chopped into small pieces so the heifers can't go through and pick out their favorite parts. If you're like me and always like to pick the chocolate out of trail mix, then I'm sure you can relate. That so, was a 2D video. Yeah, um, that was grown footage and it's kind of hard to tell from up above what a massive quantity of food that is and how it all mixes. But um, on the app, the kids will be able to really zoom in and see um, where they're at and everything everything you think okay well cows eat hay well uh three mile cows eat hay they eat potato peels they eat cotton they eat cornflakes um a compressed corn product that basically looks like cornflakes cereal 
Um, they eat a gigantic mix of everything. Uh, they have a really cool PhD nutritionist and uh, we'll have her interview uh, on here somewhere where the kids can listen to what she has to say about um, mixture and uh, all of that. E, can you go to the milk carousel next? Mm -hmm. Together, the cows produce now more than 12 million gallons degrees. of milk so each day. Everything. With 33,000 cows, the three milking parlors at Three Mile Canyon Farms is where the action is. Once a cow enters the stall, the robotic milking machine reads each cow's electronic identification device. This provides information on each cow, including how much milk she usually produces, the orientation of her udders, and her milking pressure preference. Not only does this provide real-time data on the total amount of milk and the different milk components that each cow produces, but it also personalizes the setting for each cow's comfort. By the time the robotic milking parlor slowly spins around, the cow is milked and joins the rest of the herd out in the pasture. So every, whoever's in that um, milking parlor will have the opportunity to really zoom in um, up close and kind of, especially if you um, have your AR glasses on, you'll really be able to see right where you are um, inside that milking parlor. And this, I mean, I've been out there multiple times, tons of times, and it's still my favorite part about visiting um, because the enormity of just being there and being in the middle of it is really, really cool. Um, let's go to the power of poop. Who doesn't want to talk about that? Power of poop. <laughs> Even the poop has a purpose. Barns are clean four times a day, and this flushes the manure down to Three Mile Canyon Farm's digester system. There, the digester system processes the manure so it can be used in a variety of ways. First, the digester system captures methane gas from the manure and turns it into a renewable natural gas. This renewable energy source then powers 30% of the farm's energy. Wow. Second, the manure is turned into fertilizer for Three Mile Canyon's crops. Third, after the manure is processed in the digester system, two things remain. The liquid leftover is now clean water and it is reused to flush out the barns. The remaining dried solids has a feel of sawdust and makes comfortable bedding for the cows and heifers mm -hmm. to lay on in the barns. So some of the, the team narration are actually 4-H members from um, Morrow County and there's some of our um, senior members that have been um, part of Morrow County 4-H for quite a while. So that's, um, we were excited to have them join us for this project. Uh, let's go to the calf uh, where it says calf heat. Mm -hmm. This one? Yes. We'll check out the baby. Um, so not the growing together one, but I think there's one called the first wobbly steps. Yeah, wobbly first steps. Having a calf is the first step for a cow to make milk. A healthy pregnancy and birth is only just the beginning to raising healthy cows. Here at the maternity barns, a team of farmers and staff take care of the calves daily to make sure that they are growing and thriving. So because calves are born all day long, every single day, um, it's really a cool experience because when you're there in person, you're seeing babies that are just minutes old. And those that were there behind the fence are probably um, within three to five days old. Uh, and then is there a meal for a calf eat is that one on here? What's that? What's it called? Um, maybe growing up together. I have to say, I just want to pet that cow. <laughs> can you come up with a way that we can actually feel as if you pet the cow? Team effort. After those first few months of life, calves are cared for in groups at Three Mile Canyon's calving shed. Being in a herd is an innate behavior for calves and cows. Calves interacting with each other and being together as a herd is one way Three Mile Canyon uplifts their health and well-being. 
Continued daily health monitoring and healthy nutrition can help young calves while they are still growing. Okay. Um, we'll take a minute. We'll just look at maybe, maybe one more thing. Maybe not off the calf. Can you go back to the, the overall farm meat? Mm -hmm. um, let's look at um, growing food for cows and people. It is every day you see a cow eat a potato. Three Mile Canyon Farms is a closed loop system because of the sustainable way they recycle. The fertilizer made from manure helps grow crops on the farm like potatoes, onions, mint, grass, and wheat. Byproducts from these crops would typically go to waste. Here, they are added to cows and heifers total mixed rations or TMR because they are nutrient rich. Overall, about 60% of the food the dairy herd eats is grown right here at Three Mile Canyon Farms. Everything is connected. One of my one of my favorite parts about the um, app is that I feel like we did a really good job of connecting everything um, that's there from the high tech farming, which talks a little bit about irrigation and um, the milk carousel. Everything is actually as it's there now. It's not ninety six thousand acres big here. Um, but we really are pretty, I'm pretty pleased with what we have to share uh, as far as what's on the app tabletop so far. So any questions about the farm side of this before Kristen talks about the cheese component? We may actually have another um, minute or two to see one more pin if somebody wants to call out one that looks interesting. You can chat too. There's one that you're curious about. Uh, let's look at the cow one meat because it's kind of cool the way that one's set up. Um, let's look at the cow kaleidoscope one. The kaleidoscope? This yeah. One? Yes. Okay, so we're back in the milky milk. Milk is a natural complex liquid with sugars, proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals. And now in this one, this is a 360 picture and then there are pins that you can get more information by tapping. Because milk is a complex liquid, it can be used to make a wide variety of products like cheese, butter, yogurt, and ice cream. <laughs> cow, cow we might have to think of the... Uh, milk from a Holstein cow is more ideal for making <laughs> drinking milk because they can produce higher daily milk volume. That's great. Right. Any questions? We got some more stuff in the chat. Okay. Well, that's pretty much um, a look at the farm. As we wrap up the app, you might find a couple more little pins pop up on there. Um, but that's uh, that's where we are with what's on uh, what we have for our Three Mile Canyon farms and um, a look at the dairy. So one of the important things. Um, to know is, you know, when you have a million pounds of cheese a day, where does that go and what do you do with it? So um, a sneaky tidbit of information is that about 90% of Tillamook cheese is actually made at Three Mile Canyon Farms from Three Mile Canyon Farms milk and is made in Boardman. Um, Tillamook is a giant processing plant uh, in Boardman that processes Tillamook cheese. It used to be a secret, it's not a secret anymore. So. Um, most of Tillamook cheese actually comes from Boardman, if everybody wants to know that. A million pounds is hard to fathom, like a million, we're talking a million pounds of milk a day. And the milk storage room um, is pretty ginormous. And um, I think we might end up with a pin of that milk storage room later if I didn't see it on there. Um, and 
milk trucks run 24 seven, picking up milk, taking it to be processed into cheese um, all day long, every single day. So I'm gonna reshare so we can look at the slides. Um, Kristen's gonna talk about cheese. Perfect. So even though I've been like very much involved in making this process, like seeing the app again and like seeing y'all's reactions to it definitely gave me like a big wave of like motivation. And um, so I really appreciate that because it has been a lot of hard work. So um, if y'all don't know me, I'm actually an animal scientist and um, my background is not so much like milking cows. I actually milked mice for my PhD. So I come at it from a very different perspective. So milk can come from a lot of different mammals, um, but cheese is really interesting. So I'm gonna take a second and we do have some time here. So I'm hoping that we can take a second and talk about some of the different milk products. Like what are the things that milk can make? Um, you can, this is a really fun time to do like a category kind. I don't know if you play this game virtually with your students. Um, you can do like a popcorn, but for today, if y'all want to either unmute and just say different dairy products that you can think of, or you can put it in the chat. Like cottage cheese. Yep, cottage cheese, yogurt, curds, yep. Oh, sour cream, yes, butter. Tell them the guys from, yep. Um, very much always, almost always have Tillamook ice cream in my freezer. I think Oregon makes fantastic ice cream. Whey, yeah. Whey is actually a really interesting thing right now too in the food science world. Um, people are trying to make more products with whey. Cream cheese is another one I'm not seeing, but I love a good bagel with cream cheese for breakfast. Sour cream. Oh, yep. Sour cream. Tillamook sour cream is really good. This is one of the reasons why I love studying milk. Milk has been a part of our lives for a really, really long time. About actually five years ago, a team of archaeologists dug up some really old pottery and they discovered that there was remnants of like burnt cheese at the bottom of these pots. So and those pots dated to be about 3,000 years old. So milk, milk products have definitely been a part of our lives for a very long time. It can be very nostalgic. We can have different dairy products like part of our celebrations, our cultures, our family traditions. Um, it's very much tied into our daily lives. So I want to just talk about just milk in general. So yeah, we are just focusing on cheese as one product, but one of the reasons why milk can make so many different things is because it is a natural and complex fluid. It's one of the only fluids in the world that naturally has sugars, fats, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. It's nothing added. And milk can come from a lot of different places. So today we are just talking about cow's milk. So milk can come um, from oh, a lot of different animals, sheep, goats, um, yak, buffalo, horses, mice. I could make cheese out of mice if I wanted to. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that people can make cheese as well. So today we're just kind of telling a very narrow focus of story about how cheese is made. And it kind of starts from cow's milk. Okay, so let's talk about cheese. So we learned earlier that there's 33,000 different kinds of cheese. So what are y'all's like favorite cheeses? I'll tell you mine, mine's Brie. I could live off Brie all day. Munster, day. Munster Colby. Oh, yes. oh, I'm with you, Kristen Brie. I could live on that too. Oh, okay. One from Mexico, Caso Fresco. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I cannot stand brie. I love Edam cheese. Mm -hmm. I know, cannot stand. I've tried many of them. Some of them I can, some others not. Okay. And I, and I do not like blue cheese. <laughs> oh, sticky. sticky and gooey cheese. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's so many different kinds of cheese. And if you think about it, um, cheese can be like hard, crumbly cheese. Cheese can be softer like brie. There can be like semi-cheese. Yeah, it, cheese is really quite fascinating. Nacho cheese. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mozzarella, yes. You tell I'm getting hungry, sorry. <laughs> I know, I know. I. Oh, they're all good though. That's amazing. I would like to learn all the other 30. Mm -hmm. 3,000. 2,000. <laughs> yes. Well, the interesting thing that y'all are going to learn today and your kiddos are going to learn from this app that making cheese is actually a finite process. There's actually a general amount of steps that all milk goes through to make cheese. So all these different types of cheeses kind of go through that. The recipes may change a little bit. The length of some variables may change a little bit, but about everything's the same. So it's kind of interesting that a finite process can almost create this infinite amount of different kinds of cheese. I think that's just quite fascinating. Okay, Anna. Perfect, so yeah, so we are talking about milk. So um, on the left, you can see a big vat of milk. Um, if you kind of just squint really close in, you can start to see these yellow droplets. That is actually milk fat. So we've talked earlier about, um, for example, why three mile milk Jersey cows, they can produce a lot of milk volume, but they can also make milk that is really high in milk fat and milk protein. So the variations of milk and the milk characteristics can change from breed to breed. And even within a breed, like one Holstein cow can be very different than another Holstein cow. So I think the individual variations are quite interesting. Even Tillamook has started making a cheese where it's only made from a certain cow. So you can have um, tried the same kind of made cheese like mozzarella, but it's from a different cow and you can even taste some different varieties. So there's a lot of like science and artistry in making cheese. And I'm really excited to show that in this app, that's really a big part of telling this story. What you got, Melinda? Sorry to keep bugging up. No, you're not bugging. For H in uh, Texas A&M, we took the kids to Costa Rica to learn about the land and agriculture sustainability. And we actually went to uh, the rich farmland and you know, our kids are from Texas. They had, and they're like, they're coaching this one farmer who had one cow. And they're like, how many cows do you have? They're like, this is our one. And like the kids, well, we have 10,000. I said, no correction. Your parents have 10,000 head of milking cows, right? Dairy cows. Well, it, it, they put it in perspective. They said, you know, but this one, it's a co-op. One has a cow, the other one milks it, the other one makes a cheese. So we actually went to see the process of how they make string cheese. So it was a cool thing. So it's not about how many you have, it's what you have and make the most of it. So we had to teach that to our, you know, rich city kids over there that and are you know their parents are well off that doesn't matter how much you have it's what you have and that you share with others so it's quite interesting to say the least yeah that's a really interesting perspective i'm really glad that you shared that because yeah we were starting this story talking about three mile we're talking about large quantity feeding a lot of people but there's also like the artisan part of it there's also just getting down to like just making cheese so actually where we filmed um, the cheese part is actually at Oregon State University. And so we chose the OSU Cheese Lab for a lot of different reasons. One reason is we wanted to show the community. That's a big um, theme that we really wanted to come through in this dairy app is that it making milk, making cheese and different products, it involves a lot of people. We really wanted that community story to come through. And we also wanted hands-on learning, especially with cheese, each step you see a physical change in cheese. You can learn about it in books, which is fantastic way to learn if y'all are about learning that, but hands-on learning, especially making cheese, you get to see how the textures change, the color changes, the smell, the feel, it's everything. And then this at the OSU Cheese Lab is quite fascinating because the OSU Cheese Lab is one of two creameries in the nation that is a 100% student run. It is run by undergraduate students and it is truly, um, we were there all day because it takes all day to make cheese. And it was quite fascinating to see a team of undergraduate students that were literally there from like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. There's definitely some fun breaks in between and they're doing homeworks and like, 
you know, taking breaks and going to have lunch, but just feel that like community, like they were having fun, but like also the time management. I don't know if I could commit to something like that when I was in college, but that hands on learning experience just seems so valuable to them. So that was another part that really kind of shined through in telling the story about how we made cheese. Okay, Anna. These slides are keeping me like on task because I can talk about cheese and milk all day long. So yeah, so I just said that we are focusing on the OSU Cheese Lab. That is the creamer that we're focusing on. And so I did kind of highlight this is that a finite process can almost create this infinite amount number of cheeses. So this is in general, the steps of making cheese. There's a lot of preparation of milk. Some people use raw milk. Some people use pasteurization. There's different things that are added to milk to make it more acidic. There are a lot of enzymes that are added to milk um, and everybody's recipe can change a little bit um, to make those curds. So to change from a liquid to a solid, then you can really start seeing these physical changes. And then separating out curds and whey. So we talked a little bit about how milk is a, quite a fascinating liquid because it's complex. So we talked about like milk solid. So that's the milk fats and the proteins. And when you add enzymes and you make it more acidic, they can start to form these clumps that we call curds. And everything else that's left over is called whey. And there has been a lot of really cool recent food science um, applications of whey of making different products. Um, also like whey has also been used to feed back to different kinds of animals. Like um, I used to work on a pig farm and giving cow whey back to pigs was another sustainable way to feed animals. And also we talked earlier about the different kinds of cheeses. So if you really want a hard cheese, you really wanna get a lot of that liquid out or that whey out. So there's a lot more time in pressing and um, getting that whey out. And that's the really cool part that you're gonna see in this app. It's a process called cheddaring. So cheddaring is when they make these solid curds, but then they almost make them into like a books of a page. Um, and they flip them around and there's an order to it all, kind of looks like it could be just flipping stacks. But the cool part is each slab of a curd spends the equal amount of time on the bottom. So everything is pressed out equally and what's being pressed out is that liquid or that way. So if you want like a hard cheese, a lot of cheddaring processes happen. If you want a softer cheese, you don't press out as much of that way. Then there's the salting, there's different kinds of ways that people can salt. And then there's shaping. So if you want like my beautiful brie cheese to be in a wheel, you got to put it kind of in a mold to look like that. And then the aging process can really change depending on what you're trying to make. When we were there filming, I'll share on a little secret. We got to eat some of the curds and it was fresh. So there was no aging. Like we went from like just what it was made to eating it. So it was like, particularly like no amount of time. But part of this um, 33,000 different kinds of cheese is just a little bit of change of this variable. So some cheeses can age for six months to a year or even longer, or maybe there's different kinds of enzymes that are added or cultures. So it can change the flavor a little bit. Maybe it changes the color. So that is part of this process that we are really excited to share to kiddos in the app. And then Anna, if you can hit the next slide for me. Hands-on learning. So this was probably the coolest part of telling the story was that these students are very much involved in this process. So the picture on the right may look grainy. It isn't. It is. It was 530 in the morning on a Friday and these kids drive their milk truck. That's their milk truck on Oregon State University campus. They drive out to the dairy farm and they pick up the milk from the other students that are there milking cows. It's a smaller operation, so it's not that really large thing that we saw at Three Mile. It's just about 14 cows that they milk on any given day. That's a smaller operation. But that was really cool to see that undergraduates, like, I mean, they run this. And so they are licensed to drive that milk truck. They're licensed to actually pasteurize. So these are like real skills that they are able to get in college while they're taking classes. And then you can see on the left, um, he was the lead um, team member of this and he was actually mentoring the other students that were with him. But 
he was very much testing the pH and the quality throughout the whole process. Um, so it was really cool to see, you know, if you're trying to create like high quality food to put into the market, like what really is entailing in that. So that just seemed like such an invaluable learning experience from him. And it was really cool to see him actually mentoring younger students that were coming through. So like I mentioned earlier, um, making cheese is very much like a process. Like if you can't be there in person, this virtual reality app is just, is almost like you're there. You can see how things are changing. So in the picture on the right, in that big milk tub, you can actually see there's a plastic container on top. So that was like one way that they were testing to see if the milk has started to coagulate. And this was kind of the interesting thing. I'm very much a scientist. So I like something that's like a process, but this is where the artistry comes from. Like everybody kind of has their own way of kind of starting to see like, okay, has it coagulated enough? And so they would spin this little plastic container. And when it got to this point where it wasn't really spinning anymore, because it was getting kind of stuck, they were like, okay, it's time to start cutting these up into curds. So that was really kind of interesting that it's a lot of like lived experience and sharing rather than something that you can learn in like books or a science experiment. And then the picture on the left, I don't know if y'all have had any snacks or dinner lately, but um, it's starting to make me really hungry. Those are actually the curds. So they're starting to mix them up. So the curds have been cut, the whey has been separated and they're starting to do the salting. So it's very much also a, like a physical um, operation as well. Not only are those students there like 12 hours, like driving in the morning to pick up milk to like they were done, finished weighing and bagging these curds at 6 p.m. that day. But it was also like a pretty like physical labor task of like the mixing and the cutting. So it was really just cool to see that whole process. Maybe I'll the food safety and quality. So as the picture on the left, they had different ways that the students like stayed organized on tasks to make sure that the pH was still in optimal range, everything was heating and cooling. Um, if anything was starting to like a piece of equipment wasn't working right, they were kind of using this as a way to share with each other for like problem solving. So that was really cool to see how these students are literally running the show of making cheese. And then the picture on the right is where you can see, this is the cheddaring process. So they're really big slabs of curds and they're flipping and they're taking time um, to flip them. So the whey is being separated out. Okay. Do y'all have any questions before we check out this app? What was the best part for you, Kristen, to spend the entire day there? I know I was there for most of the time to eating. I mean, it was really interesting to me to taste the cheese at different stages. It's like from that little like gloopy glob that we got at the first time to the actual curd. Yeah. I mean, it was a really incredible learning experience. So like overall, the coolest part about being a part of this project is I got to do a lot of tasting, even with like the oysters. <laughs> so like <laughs> I very much benefited from that. <laughs> part about it is um it's like the story that emerged for me making these apps especially dairy was the community of people so it wasn't even just um that there's a lot of different steps to make these but it was like all the people along the way and especially with the osu cheese lab it's it's a long day to be with a team of people for 12 hours it really felt like a tight-knit community and especially robin who is the osu cheese lab manager um, they very much like created a space that felt very welcoming for them. It was really kind of a great vibe to be around. Um, and you'll also get to see that Robin was featured in this app. And a big part for us was just making sure that there was like really cool representation, like um, like what Anna had said earlier, like if you maybe ask kids, like, what does it take to like make milk? Maybe people have a very like narrow picture of like, who is a dairy farmer and what they look like and like how that is operated. So the cool thing about this virtual reality app is trying to open the door to show people, um, people that look different and um, have different experiences and um, that are very much involved in making products that we see in our grocery store. All right. Uh, 
And I think that's what the fantastic job you all did with this uh, dairy app is that we go from seeing this really large scale tree mile farm which is really large scale process and operation and then that side of the production side to a really artisanal kind of thing and thing i think it gives the breath for the youth experiencing this app and educators using it it gives the breath of if i want to be in a dairy industry there's these different entry points and pathways that i may be motioned about and kind of gives them a real sense of what those entry points are so i think that's actually really fantastic there's a question in the chat. Monica is asking, so <laughs> no need to apologize, Monica, you're welcome. Thanks for joining us. Where do we get the app and how often do you think you will be adding new egg places to visit? <laughs> um, so Monica, we, the apps are in production right now and kind of getting to the beta phase for testing. Uh, so we'll be doing some refinement and testing them for a while. All of the apps should be available to the public by November this year, uh, unless something delays us, but um, all of the apps should be available to the public then on the app store for free. Anybody can download it. So there's five of them. As far as adding new ag places to visit, there are some conversations and opportunity satellites projects, but nothing concrete yet, but I'm pretty sure there'll be more experiences being built from, from this app for sure. And we'll make sure to keep you all updated. And Kristen, Anna, eat if you want to add anything to that. Eat. Yeah, that's correct. So, um, Susan, maybe as the content is ready, we can also share the link um, to specific experiences, or so that they can have access to them even earlier. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And also, there's going to be a feature of the headset version. And um, I guess we can talk about that, how you will be shipping headsets. Yeah. So this is a more immersive, exp the same content, but in the headset, you're actually on the 3D model next to the cow or cows. So it's much more immersive. Yeah. Thanks, Ethan. That's something we'll communicate to at that point with all of our educators. We have a finite number of headsets that we budgeted to purchase. So. Some educators can borrow sets and they can travel around through our partners for use through the headsets and you can and be more immersive experience if you put the headsets on and you're in the, this app. Or you can use your device, iPad, iPhones, um, Androids, um, smartphones that are going to use it in the way that it has been demonstrating to us, which is not, it's not as immersive as the virtual reality sets, but it's still pretty cool. Hey, are you ready? Yes. Your time to shine. <laughs> okay, so the cheese bar is still in the same 3D tabletop. It's just the part on the right. Um, so if you could start with science, in art and art in science. All cheese starts out the same way, making curds and whey. This finite process results in almost an infinite number of cheeses because of the combination of two variables, cultures and aging. Made up mostly of enzymes, the cultures are added to the curds to change the texture and the flavor over time. Different combinations of adding cultures and letting cheese age for different lengths of time result in nearly 33,000 types of cheeses, just like how mixing the primary colors can create a full color spectrum. So that was Robin, the OSU Cheese Lab Manager. Um, Robin was selected to be our hologram for the Dairy VR app, and I could not have think of a better person. Um, so that was kind of a really interesting um, analogy that I really like describing um, with cheese making, especially with young people, is the same like the color spectrum. So if you think there's only like a few primary colors, but if you mix them together, we can get this full color spectrum. So that's like one analogy that we made sure we try to incorporate in this VR app to help describe the process. Yeah, the, um, the 3D models of this were really fantastic. Could you do from liquid to solid? So now we're gonna really get into like the cheese process. 
Milk used to make cheese at the Oregon State University Cheese Lab comes from the OSU Dairy Farm. After arriving to the OSU Cheese Lab, milk is one step closer to becoming cheese. First, a long hose pumps milk off the milk truck to a large tank in the OSU Cheese Lab. There, milk is heated to a specific high temperature and then immediately cooled to pasteurize the milk. Pasteurization is another way milk quality is maintained at every step. Inside this large tank of milk is where the science and artistry of cheese making starts. After milk is pasteurized, milk is heated again and ingredients are added. Almost immediately, you can see gel-like solids forming on the top of the liquid. All right, so to keep going down this like process of cheese making, the next one, eat if you could do stack and flip. Cheese making starts out the same way, adding ingredients to milk to make solids called curds. Depending on the type of cheese, success comes from then removing different amounts of liquid or whey. Next, curds are combined to form slabs. Like stacking books, curd slabs are stacked on top of each other. Each of these slabs are rotated for equal time in each position in order to remove the same amount of whey. This process is called cheddaring because the pressure from stacking continues to push out the extra liquid whey. My favorite, can we do dice, press, and finish? After the cheddaring process, curds can either be molded into blocks of cheese or kept as curds. Today, these OSU students are packaging curds to sell. The stacks of curds are cut into strips and put through a milling machine to make bite-sized pieces. After milling, the curds are salted and thoroughly mixed before being bagged. Then the salted curds are weighed to make sure each bag weighs the same. After the curd bags are sealed, they are ready to be sold at local grocery stores. Some curds are pressed into molds to make blocks of cheese like the ones you see in the store. And don't forget, like with all products, part of the It cut out on my end, but um, what I was saying was like, <laughs> with all science stuff and then you think there's a cleaning process. So that was actually really also cool to see the students like very much are a part of like not only driving the milk truck, picking up the milk, but cleaning out the milk tank and also like cleaning up after themselves. That's a big part of that too. So I think that's always like something that's fun to talk to young people about. Um, it's very much a part of food quality, having high quality foods and it's a good thing to practice at home, so. That is kind of just a visual representation of the cheese making process. Um, kids can actually see all the different stages of that. And it really helps to kind of show the story of like hands-on learning and the OSU Cheese Lab is a really interesting opportunity for kids to get really cool skill development. Hmm. So we've previewed the app. Is there anything that you got inspired with that you would be excited to share this app with young people that you know and work with? One of the things for me, um, being rural Oregon, a lot of times kids don't have <clears throat> access to see what careers are available. So I was just sitting here looking at all the careers. So an offshoot of this app is what careers could they look at? Or what are the possibilities within just this one dairy science or dairy app? So that was exciting to see. Yeah, that's a really great point. Yeah, especially with Three Mile, um, because of their sustainability, STEM, math, engineering is very much a part of what they do. So that is something that's also really cool that kind of came out of that community piece of people that are involved. Yeah, that. The opportunity to have, I think Kristen and I both, as we were going through this whole process, we could have had 40 more pins um, mm -hmm. on the farm. And so we really had to kind of scale back everything um, for each location, just so it was a little bit more manageable. But definitely we did discuss a career component because there's so um, many 
things. And if you have youth that are looking to work in agriculture, Three Mile takes uh, summer interns every year. You have to be over 18, um, but they do take summer interns and they're really good to their summer interns. So they get paid by the hour and then they also get a $5,000 scholarship at the end of the summer. And we've had a ton of local students um, go through their internship program and continue working at Three Mile and get their degree and come back and work in finance or work in crop and soil science or work in um, ag technology and um, in the irrigator department. So there's really um, a lot of endless opportunities. And I, you know, my teacher brain goes to a culminating activity after using all of these apps to go back and look at the careers that were um, in there and then do some further research like Barb suggested. So I think that the sky is the limit on a lot of that stuff. Right. The other thing I like in both the apps that's happened, the horticulture one is linking back to OSU. Um, again, we're eight hours from campus, so they link more to BSU or other universities, which is not a bad thing, but linking them back. So I feel like it's college field trips too, you know, that what's going on on campus that's been done really well in the horticulture in this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll share on that point too, Bob, as you talked about careers, because one of the satellite little projects that came off of this, we got a, a small little grant with Sherry Cole, who works with Robin, who is the hologram in there. I've had to create a short little video that it's supposed to center that we're producing now, that it's a, like a three minute video for youth that talks about career paths and talks about the power of relationships. So there's a graphic in there that is like the whole um, cheese, artisan cheese industry. So it highlights the points of connections, kind of like what Chris and Anna started with, the points of connections. If you decide to be a cheese maker, here are the kinds of relationships along the way from the producers to providers to all of the people they work with in partnership for the food to come from farm to table. So it's a short, a small little project that probably will be out at the same time that those apps are, and those are be added in a portfolio of things that educators and youth can choose to look more and be going beyond the app, right? Great, Monica had a, a mess, uh, mentioning their middle school egg science class and high school students for their biology and food units. She's excited about using that. Also elementary students learning about plants, food, jobs, community. I think we had a comment earlier too, saying I can hardly wait to, to use this with the kids. So this is, this is very exciting for us. I can hardly wait to see the final of all this four and how educators and youth are gonna have fun using them. So as always, thank you all presenters for coming today and give us a sneak peek about what this app is, is gonna look like. It's looking fantastic. This is the second one of five that we have so our next uh, pd session which is next week it's gonna highlight the aquaculture app so we'll be looking at oysters like all of those oysters that krista ate quite a few of them <laughs> in there so i hope you can come back next week and take get a sneak peek of the aquaculture app uh, and uh, continue our journey into um, getting some feedback refining and making those available we can't hardly wait to see uh, how those are gonna be used and to see them on the goggles as well, the VR kits and, and all of that. So it's been very exciting joining. So thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you okay. for being here again. Yeah, uh, just a shout out to Kristen and Anna. Great job. It was a lot of work and uh, it came out great. And eat. your team did wonderful. Right. Fantastic. And I think earlier we had Dominique were here today. So I don't know if she's still here, but if she is, she was a beginning part of this journey as well. So a shout out to her and the initial work she put on this as well. Uh, if you could go on our website, you can look at the entire team. Everybody that has ever worked on this project is over there. Um, uh, and you can look at the next dates of PD sessions and other things that are happening. Uh, we're excited uh, to have you all here. To those of you coming back every every month, thank you so much for engaging. Um, and we'll hope to see you here next week and next month until the end of the series.